everyone. Thanks for visiting the Biodiversity Center and for taking interest in our Toxic Sunflower presentation. My name is Kelly and I'm a second year biology student here at UBC interested in botany. So today I'll be talking about a research project that I worked on over the summer with a team of people from the Biodiversity Research Center. So um, one of our team members, Kate, will be taking, talking about the second part of the presentation. Um, I will be talking about the background of our research project, while Kate will be talking about the methodology and the results. Um, I should also mention that our research project was part of the Riesberg Lab, which studies the um, evolutionary genetics of sunflowers and other species of plants and weeds. So how did I get involved in this research project? So the Undergraduate Research Organization is a club on campus that permits undergraduates to um, explore research through programs such as Rex. So Rex has three different branches, um, Applied Sciences, Sciences, and Arts. And mentors or graduate students pair up with these undergraduates to work on theoretical proposals and posters um, that are presented at the annual multidisciplinary undergraduate um, research conference um, that happens every year. So in this way, I and three other students were paired up with our mentors, uh, Celine Casey's and Dan Bach, and uh, we answered two different research questions in uh, two pairs. Um, so we, we, uh, um, we went to our first mark in um, March, and um, although not all mentor and undergraduate groups um, pairs uh, carry on after, the, after Merck. Uh, thanks to our mentors, we were able to work hands-on in the lab and answer some of the questions that we posed in our posters. So on a broad level, our research project investigated um, an aspect of species interactions. So here is a food web that shows how different um, organisms from different trophic levels interact with each other. So we can see here on the bottom left, um, these plants and shoots eat from the organic matter. Then the nematodes feed off of these plants. The next trophic level, the arthropods here, feed off of the nematodes, but also from fungi and bacteria, which in turn are also fed on by a lot of different other organisms. So this really just shows how complex and overlapping these interactions can be in um, a real life community. Um, so these interactions, species interactions, are referred to these positive and negative interactions that either inhibit or favor the mutual growth of organisms and can potentially um, shape the evolutionary trajectories of populations. So these species interactions um, is what determines whether an organism or a species can uh, fit into a community. So um, for example, if they are outcompeted or if um, they don't contribute at all to the community, um, they get kicked out. So basically, the two ways an organism can fit into a community is either by partaking in positive interactions, such as sharing um, nutrients or helping another organism to benefit themselves, or they can partake in negative interactions, such as um, uh, predation. So as I said, uh, positive species interactions are in communities, and an example of this is mutualism. So here on the left, uh, we have an antelope with uh, some oxpeckers. So these oxpeckers are feeding off ticks that are on the antelope. And these ticks can actually be pretty uh, harmful to the antelope by spreading diseases or even, cause, even causing anemia by blood loss. So um, these oxpeckers are benefit benefited by the food that the ticks um, have, um, give them. And then the antelope also benefits by getting rid of these ticks. A plant example of mutual, mutualism is the peony plant, which holds a population of ants. So this peony plant makes, uh, pol um, uh, makes nutrients for the ants to feed off of. And in return, the ants will irritate herbivores uh, that try to eat the plant. So both of them benefit in this react interaction. Another type of positive species interaction is commensalism. So this is when one species benefits, but the other species, um, or another, another species isn't benefited or hurt. So uh, they're pretty neutral. So this example here is of a clownfish and an anemone. So this clownfish lives in the anemone. 
and it doesn't get stung because uh, what it does is it gently rubs its body on the tentacles of the anemone until it makes a mucus around its body that makes it immune to the stinging of the tentacles of the anemone. So in this way, the clownfish can live in the anemone, but the anemone is not harmed or benefited from its living there. And here we have another plant example. Um, and this is a tree taking the nutrients of a dead tree. So it's being helped, uh, but the dead tree doesn't, um, it's dead, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> And like I said, um, negative species or uh, negative interactions are also in communities. And um, so here is an example that we're all very familiar with, um, the mosquito. So female mosquitoes will suck her blood to help their eggs. And so they do this by using their long, elongated mouth part to penetrate our skin and um, make, uh, put their saliva into our uh, bloodstream. And so this has a number of effects. Um, it's kind of used as a painkiller so that we don't actually notice our blood being drained. Um, but it also uh, gives that itching sensation after they leave, like a reaction um, that we get from food, right? Um, but it also can be very dangerous because it can give us diseases like yellow fever or malaria. Um, so it helps them, but we are harmed in, the, in this interaction. And here is another parasite called mistletoe. Uh, so this mistletoe has a similar structure of the mouth of the mosquito, and it's called a hostorium. So the hostorium, in the same way, penetrates the tree branch, takes its nutrients and waters, and grows um, while the tree is hurt in this interaction. So predation is also a negative interaction. So here we have a mink who eats uh, the fish. So the mink is benefiting from the food of the fish, but the fish dies in the process. And plants, too, can be predators. Um, so this here is a Venus flytrap, which is a carnivorous plant, which is not very common. And the hairs around its mouth um, helps it indicate when an um, insect lands on its mouth, and it causes its jaws to close and for it to swallow the insect and break it down using digestive enzymes. So these losers of these negative interactions, the ones that are harmed, like the hosts of parasitism or the prey from predation, um, they have adapt, found ways to adapt and uh, ways to avoid being hurt. So an example of these defenses um, are physical defenses, like spines of this puffer fish. So this makes it hard for predators to eat the fish and also for uh, parasites to land on it. Plants, too, can have spikes on them, and they're called trichomes. So, so these trichomes have a similar function, and they make it hard for insects to land on them. So this example here is of a tomato plant. Here is a large picture of a sunflower that also has trichomes. And you can see the little white spikes coming out. Those are the trichomes. And they, have, right, they, they um, hurt the insects that try and land on them. Uh, but trichomes can have different functions. So in this case, they make it just painful uh, for insects to land on them. But different trichomes, like this one here on the very bottom left, called the glandular, uh, this one holds chemicals that can be released when stimulated, and so it can hurt uh, predators that way too. So uh, defenses don't have to be harmful to uh, predators. So in this example, we have camouflage. Um, so if you guys can look right in here, we have an insect hiding in the trees. Give you guys a couple seconds to try and find it. And there it's highlighted for you. So that's a stick bug in, on, among the trees. Um, so plants, too, can camouflage. And these are seeds from a uh, desert sunflower. So the ones on the left are from sunflowers that grow in orange sand. And the ones on the white, um, the white seeds are from sunflowers that grow in white sand. Um, so this helps them camouflage with the sand to avoid being um, found by predators such as birds and giving them a chance to uh, grow. So um, there's also, apart from physical defenses, we also have chemical defenses. So this is when animals or organisms synthesize uh, chemicals in them, like poisons. So here uh, on the left, we have an example of a poisonous frog. And they have these really bright colors uh, to show that they have these poisons and to warn predators. 
And on the right, we have a skunk. So although their musk spray is not actually harmful, um, it's used more as a distraction. So if the skunk was feeling threatened, it will spray this musk and distract their predator, and it gives them a chance to run away. So plants also have chemical defenses um, called secondary metabolites. So secondary metabolites are chemicals that are made that are not used for growth or reproduction. Um, so for example, like cellulose or lignin, um, like those of tree branches or certain leaves, they're the things that make it hard for us to digest. Um, other secondary metabolites are poisons. So they can be found in plant leaves or plant roots. And in this example on the left, we have poisonous berries. On the right, we have a caterpillar eating a leaf. And um, in a, if, for example, this leaf was poisonous and it had uh, salicylic acid in it, um, when it is digested by the caterpillar, um, it will slow down the metabolism and actually stunt its growth and harm the caterpillar. So lowopathy is also a type of secondary metabolite. Um, and this is what we really studied in, in our research project. And so you can see that these uh, allelopathic chemicals in the ground that these trees produce um, create um, a, a barrier around the tree that either inhibit growth or uh, kill all the organisms around it, like in this picture here on the right. So there I have it um, outlined for you guys to see um, where the allelopathic chemicals affect the plants right over here. Um, and where they're not affected. So allelopathy comes from the Greek words allelos, meaning one another, and pathy, meaning suffering. So it's the suffering of one another, which what, uh, what is uh, what allelopathic chemicals do. So it was first recognized in ancient Greece, um, and it was described as a sickening of the soil. And um, Austrian um, botanist, Hans Molsch uh, first termed it allelopathy and called it a chemical re interaction among plants. So here is a mechanism of how allelopathy works. Um, so allelopathic chemicals can be found in the leaves of plants or in the roots of the plants. And in this example, this diagram we have here, um, it shows the allelopathic chemicals being in the leaves and they go, they are inserted into the soil where they mingle and um, then they affect other plants and inhibit growth. So it's a key mechanism of plant defense, invasion, adaptation, and inhibition of other communities and populations. So these are some examples of species that use allelopathy. Here on the left, we have a coastal shiok, which is native to India. And it uses a leaf way of transferring allelopathic chemicals into the soil. On the right, we have spotted knapweed, which is uh, native to Eastern Europe. And it uses a root way of transferring chemicals. And it actually has an allelopathic chemical um, called catechin that does this. So Jerusalem artichoke is a species that we studied. So um, the common sunflower that we know of, um, mostly know, um, has allelopathic uh, chemicals. But a lesser known um, relative of sunflowers is Jerusalem artichoke. So the Jerusalem artichoke scientific name is Helianthus tuberosus, and it was um, originated from North America, and it was um, transferred to Eastern Europe, because, into Europe, because of the tubers that they produced. Um, so they were domesticated for their tubers, which is like the potato tubers that we eat today. So this is a picture of domesticated Jerusalem artichoke. So this is when the Native Americans used to um, garden these uh, Jerusalem artichokes and use them for these tubers that they made. And then when they were imported into Europe around the 1600s, um, they were a widespread crop. Um, but then when the potato took over, they became a lesser crop. And eventually, they escaped cultivation, and they became invasive in Europe. And so here is a picture of invasive Jerusalem artichoke in a field in Slovakia. So you can see here, this is a whole field of just Jerusalem artichoke. Um, it has killed out all the other species that live there, and um, it's just them. So Kate here is going to talk about um, why we're interested in Jerusalem artichoke and the research questions that we had about it.
Okay. So, um, so I'm Kate. I'm also a biology student here at UBC, and I'm a volunteer here at the museum. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more specifically about Helianthus tuberosus, um, allelopathy, and why we were interested in it. And then I'll be taking you through how a research project like this is set up and some of the results that we found. So like Kelly was saying, this is an invasive population of Helianthus tuberosus. It's been proposed that it's using allelopathy as one of its mechanisms of invasion. So we had a couple of questions that we wanted to answer about this particular species of sunflower. And the first is, is it allelopathic? So is it indeed allelopathy that's allowing Helianthus tuberosus to be so successful as an invasive species? If it is, we wanted to know where the allelopathic effect came from. So what I mean by that and why I've put up two new sunflower species there is Helianthus tuberosus is actually a hybrid species. So it came about when these two parent species mated together and a whole new species was produced. Um, so we want to know if either of these are allelopathic. If they are, it would suggest that allelopathy was inherited during this hybridization event. Our third question was whether invasive populations were more allelopathic than native populations. So are the flowers that are running wild on the invadive, invasive range, are they more toxic than the ones that are on the non-invasive range? If they are, it could suggest that allelopathy is an adaptive invasiveness trait. So the invasive population is more toxic because it needs it. It's using it as an, invasiveness, as an invasion mechanism. This is how a project to measure allelopathic effect is set up. You take tomato seeds or any kind of indicator species. And indicator species are just species that are really susceptible to allelochemicals. So they're a good indicator of whether allelopathy is present. And you germinate them in petri dishes filled with water. This is like your zero or your baseline for how the plant is supposed to grow. Plants like water. They grow well in them. And then what we do is we make tea out of the plant that we're trying to, that we're measuring. So you take the leaves of whatever plant you're interested in, in our case it's Helianthus tuberosus, and you make what we call an aqueous leaf extract. You attempt to germinate the tomato seeds in your leaf tea, and then you measure how well they grow compared to how well they grew in water. Um, the, expect the expectation being that any secondary metabolites in the leaves of this plant are going to inhibit the growth of your indicator species. But even if you have a non-allelopathic plant, it's still got secondary metabolites in it. So the, the tomato seedlings aren't going to grow as well as they did in water just because this isn't water. But when you compare it to an allelopathic plant species, the, the way that the growth is inhibited is much more significant. So this is a hypothetical setup for how that experiment could go. You grow it in water, and the plants grow nice and strong. You grow them in a non-allelopathic plant, and they grow, just not as well. But in allelopathic plant leaf extract, not every seed germinates, and the ones that do are kind of small and sickly. So the reason that we use this tea method, rather than having a petri dish filled with concentrated allelochemicals, is because this more closely represents what goes on in nature. Like Kelly was talking about, a mechanism of allelopathy is for the plant to deposit its chemicals into the leaves. The leaves fall into the soil. Those chemicals are integrated into the soil and then taken up by the receiver. So by having a leaf tea rather than a concentrated petri dish filled with toxic chemicals, we're getting a better estimate of how allelopathy can impact the growth of plants. So now we have some data. Uh, this is a figure from a paper published in 2011. And they did what, they used the mechanism I just described for their experiment. And they tried to grow tomato seeds in Helianthus tuberosus. They also tried to grow rice, maize, lettuce, and wheat. This horizontal line across the middle is how well the plants grew in water. So that's 100% growth. And you can see that no matter the indicator species and no matter what was being measured, when you tried to grow these plants in Helianthus tuberosus, it always fell short of 100%. So growth was inhibited when you grew them in Helianthus tuberosus, which definitely suggests allelopathy. It's also important to note that while everything fell below 100, some fell further than others. So rice and lettuce don't really compare to maize. So allelopathy seems to be system dependent. Uh, there's variability in the ways that plant species can react to allelopathic chemicals. So the thing about this study, while it does suggest allelopathy, is that they only use like five Helianthus tuberosus individuals. And what if they just happened to pick the five most toxic plants? What we wanted was species-wide confirmation that Helianthus tuberosus is allelopathic. 
And remember, we also wanted to test more than one plant species. We wanted to test the parents as well. And we wanted to test more than one population. We wanted to look at invasive versus native. So to answer our research question, we had to grow a lot of sunflowers. This is the greenhouse where we grew a lot of our sunflower specimen. In addition to needing a ton of sunflowers, we also needed a lot of tomato seeds, which were our chosen indicator species. Each individual sunflower gives you four petri dishes filled with leaf tea. Uh, we put nine tomato seeds in each petri dish. So at nine seeds per dish with four dishes per sunflower, and where we used 386 sunflowers over 11 weeks of conducting this experiment, Kelly and I were part of the lucky team of people that got to come in every day of the week and count out of nine how many tomato seeds have germinated today for 13,896 tomato seeds. And this is an underestimate because it doesn't count the initial experiment we did to validate the protocol. In addition to counting binary like that, yes or no, did the tomato seed germinate, we also looked at how well the seedling grew. This is another indicator of a allelopathic effect. The box in blue are seedlings that were grown in water, and the box in red are seedlings grown in allelochemicals. So you can see that while approximately the same number of tomato seeds germinated, these ones are clearly having their growth inhibited. So this is another important piece of data for us to get. If you look even closer, this is the shoot of a seedling, and it grows nice and long in water, and it grows fairly well in allelochemicals, but the root, which should grow nice and long, is really stunted or sometimes non-existent when growing in allelochemicals. So you can imagine that if it's the root that the plant uses to take up nutrients and water from the soil, if allelochemicals are inhibiting root growth, they're inhibiting plant growth. And now we have our data. So this is a graph that shows the average number of seeds that germinate as the week goes on. Um, on Saturday, which is the first day that you put seedlings in our petri dishes, nothing grows. On Sunday, nothing grows. On Monday, you go up to 55% germination. This curve is seedlings that were grown in water. So this is the way they're supposed to grow. Um, as the week goes on, more and more seeds germinate. And by the end, you've got all nine of them germinating 100%. Then we tried to grow them in our potentially allelopathic plant species. So this is a graph that's going to answer the question, is Helianthus tuberosus allelopathic? There's our seedlings grown in water, and they go all the way up to 100. Uh, the green line are seedlings grown in Helianthus tuberosus. So you can see that by the end of the week, they don't get to 100%. Some seedlings don't germinate. Also, the start to germination is really delayed. Monday, which is the first day that seeds are supposed to germinate, in water, you get up to 55%. And in tuberosus, you only get to like 5 So this cap at 70% germination and the severely delayed start to germination definitely suggests allelopathy in Helianthus tuberosus. Our next question was, where did the allelopathic effect come from? So are either of the parent species allelopathic? Did Helianthus tuberosus inherit allelopathy? This is our blue curve, which is uh, seedlings grown in water. The green one, again, is Helianthus tuberosus, so suggesting allelopathy. The pink one is one of the parent species, Helianthus divaricatus. It gets pretty close to 100% by the end of the week. And the red one is the other parent, Helianthus grossesseratus. So Helianthus divaricatus, while it doesn't get to 100, this would be more like the example we looked at with a non-allelopathic plant. So the secondary metabolites are inhibiting growth because it's not water, but it's not so significant to suggest allelopathy. Grossesseratus, on the other hand, its start to germination is even more severely delayed than tuberosis. You don't even really start to see germination until Tuesday. And then it's pretty much on par with tuberosis, capping out at 70% germination at the end of the week. So this definitely suggests allelopathy in Helianthus grossesseratus. So it looks like, yeah, allelopathy was inherited during a hybridization event. And we know which parent species it came from. It came from Helianthus grossesseratus. Our final question, are invasive populations more allelopathic than native populations? So is allelopathy an adaptive invasiveness trait? Again, we've got our seedlings growing in water. They grow nicely, all the way up to 100%. The pink line is the invasive population. And then the red line is the native population. So I think you can see from looking at this graph that the answer is no. Uh, while both of these appear, appear to be allelopathic, both populations are allelopathic, neither is significantly more so than the other. 
So while it looks like tuberosis is using allelopathy as a mechanism of invasion, that's, what make, that's part of what makes it so successful as an invasive species, um, it's not an adaptive invasiveness trait. The European population, the one that's invasive, is not significantly more allelopathic than the native population. So why is our toxic sunflowers way cool? Why is allelopathy way cool? This kind of work has a lot of applications. There's fundamental applications about building our understanding of allelopathy and uh, of the species we were studying, um, such as understanding the origin of toxic chemical traits, like we saw how allelopathy was inherited during a hybridization event. There's also practical applications in agriculture and forestry. Um, allelopathy can be used to develop natural herbicides and insecticides. It can be used to control invasive species and to conserve ecosystems and biodiversity. So this is an example of how allelopathy can be used in agriculture uh, through the planting of allelopathic crops. So on the left here, a non-allelopathic crop is planted. So it's growing, but so are weeds. And the weeds are taking up valuable space and nutrients that the crop needs. We want the crop to have as much space and nutrients as it wants, because we want it to grow big so we have lots of food. The, on the right here, they planted an allelopathic crop. So just like that field of Helianthus tuberosus wasn't letting anything else grow in it, and just like those two tree species looked like they had a force field up where nothing else was going around them, uh, the allelopathic crop isn't letting any weed invade its space. So it's getting all the space, all the nutrients, and this crop can grow nice and big. Another way allelopathy can be used in agriculture is this technique called living mulch. So rather than the crop itself being allelopathic, you take an allelopathic plant and grind it up and make a mulch out of it and sow the mulch in with the crop. And then the allelochemicals in the mulch are what inhibit uh, growth of the weeds. You have to be careful about which allelopathic plant you choose because you don't want the growth of the crop species inhibited as well. But like we saw earlier, there's variability in the way that plant species respond to allelochemicals. So not unimaginable that you could find the perfect allelopathic crop for your mulch. The allelochemicals themselves can be harnessed for natural herbicides and insecticides. So this is good because it decreases our reliance on the use of synthetic chemicals for these purposes, which can sometimes actually contribute to biodeterioration. And this is an example of that in action. So yellowneck caterpillars are a really horrible pest species. The larvae are laid in the, in the leaves of the plants, and then when they hatch, they skeletonize the foliage really quickly. Um, currently, the treatments for their control are pesticides based on bacteria or on man-made versions of plant chemicals. So what this, these guys did is they made a pesticide out of allelochemicals. And it worked way better than what's currently in use. In addition, the pesticides currently being used only work very well on very young larvae. So you have to catch the pest problem right away to have a chance of beating it. The, allelo the allelochemically based pesticide um, worked on adult larvae as well, or older larvae. So it's, it's definitely a promise. Knowing about allelopathy and understanding how it works also helps to conserve ecosystem productivity. So allelopathic plants inhibit the growth of other species around them. And even if you control that allelopathic species, the soil chemistry might have been changed so dramatically that the original population can't live there anymore. So um, this reduces the growth and the productivity of the entire ecosystem. And we need productive ecosystems because we rely on them for functions such as uh, water purification or air purification, nitrogen fixation, carbon fixation. So understanding how allelopathy is, in, is affecting our ecosystems can help us to conserve those functions. It's also important for you if you want to plant a garden. So if you try to grow the allelopathic Helianthus tuberosus, while it is a beautiful sunflower, it will be the only thing that ever grows in your garden. So rather than having nice, diverse gardens where every plant species stays in its lane and takes up just its own space, uh, tuberosus will grow wild and take over everything. And so as our final note, Kelly and I just want to thank the two other undergraduates that helped us out with this project. We also really want to thank our mentors, Celine and Dan. And thank you guys for coming to our talk today. Kelly and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, enjoy the rest of the museum and enjoy the rest of your day.